to say that in comparison as the better book amongst the books in the Bible or anything like that. Um, we have this doctrinally rich book, and then you get into Romans chapters 6, 7, 8, and 9. It becomes the richest sections of the book. So it's, there's quite a bit of theological debate that goes on amongst these chapters. And, um, uh, and just it's, a, it's, it's something you can spend qu quite a bit of time in here. And as is our case, we are spending time in these chapters, but we're not... Um, Exegeting everything out of them. The word, who's heard of the word exegesis? You ever come across that word before? I know, I know Dana has because I say it all the time. I know Brett has, and I imagine his family uh, has heard about it. it it's, it's what we get from the, uh, if you translate it literally, it would be drawing out, I guess you could say. Drawing out of scripture. So if you're sitting and reading your Bible, you're, in a general sense, you're doing exegesis. You're drawing out there what's what's written in the Word of God, and we're, we've been drawing out some different doctrines here. Um, and there's, you could, I guess you could say, levels of exegesis. You could spend a lot of time doing a lot of drawing out of the, out of the well of God's Word here. Um, it's, it, it could be, we have infinite exegesis. That, yeah, that's the way I'm going to say that. I'm, again, I, I sometimes I, I say things and vocabulary is not always right, but, you know, I'm, I'm just making up words as we go along here. So. <laughs> Exegesis is a real word. But you could spend the rest of your life, and, and we will, drawing it out from the Word of God, what He has to tell us, how He is, convicts us through it, encourages us through it, brings us uh, more information about Himself. So we'll, we're going to go into the um, chapter 7 and looking at 7 through 13, and we're going to draw out with us that the Holy Spirit is going to teach us here from the words here. So as way of review, I'll, go, I'll, I'll say this. So what have we learned since we have discussed the law? So this is kind of specific what we're going to be talking about. Since we have discussed the law and the law and the relation to the believer. Um, we've, we've discussed many things. In chapter 5, verse 20, we saw uh, specifically that the law exposes sin. It, it brings knowledge of sin. Remember we talked about um, before the law, you didn't really have the information about, you know, we look back to the Decalogue or the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not murder, uh, and, and so on. Covet, lie, take the name of the Lord in vain, just to name a few. But with the law, it came to come, out, come about that now we can name specifics. We see some specifics about the law. But the law exposes sin. Um, we also see uh, in verses 1 through 6 here of the what we went last week, that the law was binding, but it always showed how bound a sinner without Christ is to sin. We're in bondage to sin when you're not saved. Um, and, and the law was able to express that. The law was not made to save. It was never the, the um, if I can use the word device, that was used that God said, all right, you do this, and then you're good enough to be saved. It was never for that. But it was to show the need for Jesus' death, and that only it could save. It pointed to Christ. Paul calls it a tutor or a schoolmaster um, in one of his epistles. The believer is bought out of the slave market of sin. Believers should live in Christ and not in sin. Why is that? Because we have died and have been released from from the bondage of sin. We've been bought out. That's where we get the word redeemed. Um, and that doctrine of redemption <clears throat> is we were, we were there in the slave market of sin, and the Lord's death redeemed us out of that, bought us out of that. Now we are his slaves. Um, a whole new perspective on slavery. I, I, uh, I know it's, it's not a very popular topic today, but we are considered slaves to Christ, servant, and that is that's the, one of the best positions you could be in because he is the Lord. <clears throat> but today, we're going to see and allow the Holy Spirit to use this. And he's, he's going to show us the exceeding sinfulness of sin. And sh sin shows us how bad our good is. How bad our good is. Let's open uh, in prayer before we get into the verses again. Father, pray again you would take this time. You would glorify yourself here. Lord, as we are here to be fed on it, I pray that um, our appetites would be wet by it and that we would, it would grow, that we would spend more time in it. 
But this evening that your spirit would have the freedom to move in our midst and be able to do his work of conviction and drawing um, even the believer closer to himself. Lord, as we find out this information that we would not just be storing up this knowledge for ourselves either. Lord, as we learn this evening that it would give us a zeal and a, 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 com a compassion for the lost to go out and to share the tremendous uh, wonder that we see here from your word this evening. And I pray that you be glorified in all these things. In Jesus' name, amen. So starting off here, as Paul has been doing pretty frequently in the book, he starts off with a question, if you will. And the question is seen in verse 7. It says this, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? And then his typical response, God forbid, or may it never be. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. Um, it's interesting, the word lust and the word covet, and then if you go down in chapter, or verse 8, and it uh, says about wrought me all manner of concupiscence, it's the same word in Greek. Um, so uh, it could... It can mean lust, it can mean covetousness, it can mean concupiscence, which is not a very common word we use today, or desire, and, and it'd be a sinful desire would be what's being taught in the passage here is how it's defined in the context. <clears throat> so the question is, is the law sin? Why does Paul ask at the very beginning of this verse, what shall we say then? So why does he say that? What was uh, said about the law that drew this question out. Because as he's written this book, as the Holy Spirit has used him, there's always, it's not, there's not a therefore here or a wherefore here in these verses, but it always goes back to what we've learned. And then he builds upon what those things in, in next sections of Scripture, next, um, call them pericopes or periscopes, I think it's, either one of those pronunciations are right. Well, I'm going to use both of them. But different sections, he's building upon these things. And it's for the sake of these Roman believers to understand God's grace, to understand um, exactly what's uh, maybe going on in their lives relating to the law and how the, the Jewish people, the Judaizers especially, could come in potentially and, and try to bring people back under the law and call it something that would make people righteous, where he's teaching that that's not the case, our righteousness is in Christ. But he's, again, just building on the doctrines here. So why does he make that statement? What shall we say then? Is the law sin? What, what brought this up? So basically, the law caused us to recognize sin as sin, and it also, the law, it aroused the desires to sin. And he uses that example of covetousness. But the law does that. It arouses the desire to sin, or the knowledge that is brought out um, about sin kind of drives you to sin. And I'm going to explain that a little bit more as we get to uh, get to. Uh, some verses that talk about it again. But the law here is itself doesn't cause the sin, but it illuminates the mind and the fact that what you are doing, this is sin. And it, at times it, it drives people to do that, or people's nature is driven more to sin in relation to that. So the question comes up, is the law sin? And then Paul's response, may it never be. And that's his typical resounding answer to these questions that are... Um, Obvious no's get the answer for him. <clears throat> so, on the contrary, though, the law is not sin. It points to sin. Remember that we were sinners because of Adam, because of being born into this world. Uh, we've talked about that. I can't remember when we talked about that in our traveling through here in Romans, but uh, it's called the doctrine of original sin. Um, I am lost because of the fact that I was born in Adam. It, it goes through, I want to say it's in chapter 5, it kind of goes into the first Adam and the last, or the second Adam, but, um, or last Adam. But because I am born, and because Adam sinned and fell, all of his progeny, everyone who would be born, who is, he was a human, is going to get that sin nature that, from that first sin. So all that happens. So we remember that the law didn't make me sin. I was a sinner to begin with. Everyone needs to be saved. It, it, my sinfulness didn't happen, uh, and the fact that I'm a sinner didn't occur at the first sin that I committed. And it, it's not based on that. It's based on the fact that we are lost. Now, yet we do sin because of the sin nature and all those things. 
uh, we will sin. There's no way of getting around that. There's no way to keep this law. And there's no way that we could ever stand up and say, you know what, I just didn't, didn't ever do anything wrong. Next, uh, the law itself. As we have discovered, the law lets us know sin, gives us knowledge of it. So what if you had no idea you were doing it wrong? What if you didn't have that law? And this again kind of clarifying what I just said about uh, original sin. If you had no idea that you were doing wrong, you were driving down the road and, and you didn't see the speed limit sign, um, and you could sit here and plead ignorance to a police officer, but they would have every right to, to uh, fine you for breaking the speed limit that's out there. Um, that's not maybe not the best analogy. I know there's some breakdown in that. We have some wiggle room sometimes amongst uh, people that, uh, the sheriffs and things like that. But saying that, if you, what if you had no idea you were doing wrong? That law wasn't there. Yet the thing was, you, there's still a judge that is still going to condemn for that. There's still God. Whether you were aware of the law or not, condemnation comes because you are, um, you were born. I don't know how to say it any better than that. So here lies the value of the law. It exposes what we are. It's good not to be in ignorance. It's, it's, I know we have that phrase, ignorance is bliss. You know, there are times that I wish I didn't know to pop on the news and uh, wish I didn't find out that bit of information. But especially in light of, of salvation, ignorance is not bliss. It is, you need to know that you're a sinner. That's when we go out and we share the gospel with individuals. We, we have to make sure when we do that, we point out, you know, you are a sinner and you need to be saved. People have to come to that realization that I actually have a genuine need here. It's not just this individual telling me I'm a bad person and, um, and, and all that. But I need to know that um, I need to have a knowledge of that sin. And Paul uses, if you would, the example here of coveting. So he says, um, he finishes up the, uh, verse 7. By, but, uh, so, nay, I had not known sin but by the law. For I had not known lust or coveting or desire, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. <clears throat> so uh, here's that example of, though as innocuous as coveting is, because I can sit here and want something that someone, someone has all day long. But and at least in, this, in our society and amongst most societies, we look at that and say, oh, they're, just, they're just really desiring what they have. They may be upset or bitter over the case, but they didn't go out there and steal it. But we have this example of, of just coveting, not even the action of stealing coming into this. That is worthy of punishment. It's worthy of condemnation. So the law had, uh, had its work amongst the unsaved in here in ex expressing uh, what sin is. It's not, the law is not sin, but it exposes it. We know what it is. We know what sin is. We see how the Jews could have very readily um, understood what was going on as he's He's preaching to the, uh, or writing to the uh, Roman church here. Um, they would have understood the law. They would have understood those things. So we should be grateful that the law exposes our sinfulness to show us that we need saving. And I know that here this evening, most of us would confess that we have accepted Christ. But again, we can, we can celebrate in that. The Lord, you know, got a hold of my heart, maybe through an individual or, or what, whoever it was, however it came about. And he showed me my sinfulness. And it brought me to him. Verses 8 and 9, we see how sin takes advantage. Sin is like a, a fighter, if you would, a boxer. That boxer, when, when they're in a ring, they're looking um, for an opening. They're looking for the individual's, the, their opponent's guard to be down. When that, their guard's down, their hands are dropped. Um, they're looking for that. And sin is doing the same thing. As soon as it sees an opening, it takes an advantage. And the thing about boxers, as rough as the sport may be, uh, some of them hit a lot harder. Mike Tyson was known for uh, hitting pretty hard for the size of the man. And, and people were afraid for fighting this individual. Um, but sin is that way. When it comes in and, and sees an opening, it goes in for the kill. It, it does the most devastating attack it can possibly bring about there. That's the way sin is. Verse 8, 
But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence or covetousness. For without the law, sin was dead. So sin takes advantage of the opportunity. For the unbeliever, that is, the, the unbeliever is kind of like, going back to that example of the fighter, they're like the worst fighter ever. They don't know when to keep their guard up. Uh, it's, it's interesting. I, I mean, I've taken, I, I took jiu-jitsu for several years. did a lot of sparring and things like that. And anytime a new person came in to um, spar in the class, um, you'd have to constantly tell them, keep your guard up, keep your guard up. Or their opponent's foot or fist would have gotten through enough. <laughs> and they realized, okay, i got to put that guard up. But the, new, the unbeliever is like an individual who just doesn't get it. They're just constantly being um, dominated, if you would, by sin. For the believer, though, you have the armor of God, Ephesians 6. And not only do we have the armor, but we also have the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, to help us combat those things. We have the Holy Spirit in us um, that uses that sword to help guide us when sin, an opportunity to sin comes up, up to us. We have the opportunity to defend ourselves against it and to uh, guard ourselves against it. But it still can be asked, are you giving opportunity here? Because sin is going to take the occasion. It's going to take uh, and take the occasion to get in there and to mess things up. Sin also tries to distort the the uh, what law was, what the law is. So, again, reading the verse here, verse eight. But sin, taking occasion or taking the opportunity by the commandments, you can see how it's using the law and the commandment in a way that would be confusing. So it's not the commandment or the law that's bad, but it's sin and it's working. So, but, so again, but sin, taking the occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. <clears throat> Excuse me. So like a child being told not to do something, and, and the common example of that is the cookie jar. So like the, the child who is told not to do something, sin takes advantage of that, of the fallen nature. And desires come in to rebel. So if, if you made fresh cookies and you put them in the cookie jar and you've got a child and you don't say anything about those cookies, and let's say the child was outside all day, didn't smell anything, didn't see any evidence of cookies being made or anything, there's not going to be a, a, a desire to go get those cookies. Uh, but the minute that you tell the child, okay, I just baked cookies, these are for later after dinner, now the, the child's going to be like, Okay, I know there's cookies there, and, and maybe I can get over there and get some cookies about mom or dad seeing or whatever the case. And you can, whether it be cookies or whatever the case, when you tell someone no, typically they test the boundaries. But that's um, kind of what happens here. But as sin takes, takes that occasion by the commandment, and it brought in me all manner of concupiscence, all manner of desires that can come up and to, to think about sinning and, and to sin. And then finally it says, for without the law, sin was dead. Now, I need some explaining here. So not dead in the sense of that it's powerless, not dead, but more like dormant. Um, now the word that's used in the Greek is the word that we use in Greek, it's like dead. But the idea, and you'll see it here through the verse here, uh, through the verses here, it's more of a dormancy. It's more, it's there, not being active per se. It's not having that, um, now I know not to touch the cookie jar, instead of I may go check out the cookie jar, I don't know if there's cookies in it. Or, now I know that I'm not supposed to murder, I'm not supposed to lie, and I'm not supposed to steal. Now, now I've, I, I know these things and it tends to, just the sin nature wants to push those boundaries, rebel against those boundaries. So, for with me, or for without the law, sin was dead. <clears throat> for the ignorant, sin looks dead. It gives off this appearance of being harmless. For the unbeliever, that's especially true. It's just, you know, it, it, it's harmless. I, I can go do this. I'll live my best life. You know, you only live once. There's a lot of different catchphrases that different generations have used. But the problem is um, that it doesn't remain that way. It doesn't remain that way. Verse 9 says, For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. So here, the realization of sin occurs, or the reality of its work is, is realized here. 
So, for I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. So we're going to examine, we're going to split this up a few, few different times here. So what is, it, what is Paul saying here when he says, for I was alive? Um, we think we are alive. As an unbeliever especially, we think we're doing fine. We're, we're uh, living a, a good life. We're not going out and acting crazy and hurting a lot of people and taking advantage of people and those things. But you know what? I, I'm alive. I'm doing okay. Everything's all right. <clears throat> and, and sin really isn't realized. And what Paul isn't saying is he isn't saying before the law came, like historically, that those people who, who were pre-dispensation of the law, that they were alive and, and towards God and not sinners or not condemned to, to, to death if they didn't trust in the promise that was given. <clears throat> but it definitely has this mentality of, look at all the good I've done. I'm, I'm doing okay. I'm, I'm, I'm okay. I'm not dead. <clears throat> Get a sip of water here. So I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. So again, apart from the law, I was unaware of my lostness. I, I didn't really know how bad it was. And yes, there's conscience. Uh, 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 Anyone who's unsaved, the Lord, the Lord gives conscience to humanity all together. Saved and unsaved, we still have that. We have the spirit that works with ours as a believer. But the unsaved, they, they know right from wrong to some degree. <clears throat> but the law brings the real, really brings the details in here. <clears throat> and the law itself is the condemning agent here. It, it is showing you that they are that you are condemned. And then it, finally it says here. But when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. It wasn't the law working hand in hand with sin. It wasn't the case there at all. And that's why I said, when it first said, uh, when we define what the law is, uh, at the end of verse 8 it says, for when without the law, sin was dead. It's not saying it's, it's completely non-effective. It doesn't do anything. But we see here, when the law came, when the commandment came, sin revived. It sprang back to life. It woke up from its dormancy. Um, and then it used the law to um, bring all manner of concupiscence, as verse 8 says. So the law exposed sin and the reality of sin uh, in the life of an individual. Verses 10 and 11, we see uh, that we were proved to be dead. And the commandment which was uh, ordained to life, I found to be unto death. So my hopes are shattered here. What I was hoping on, what a lost person here is hoping on and hoping in, and the goodness of their works and, and their doing good, but when the commandment came in all this, um, it really exposed the fact that I was dead. It was human sinful nature to think that they were alive, that they were okay, that keeping, um, uh, keeping everything kosher with everyone around them. I, I'm doing good. That, that's sin in itself. That's this idea that Satan works with. <clears throat> so this idea of, of hoping in works is futile. Hoping and trusting in, in our traditions that we hold. And as we've talked about on multiple occasions, maybe family ties that we have. You know, my grandparents were, were believers. This is what we do, and, you know, we're okay. That, that's never good. That's trusting in works. That's always condemning. But in that... Uh, these hopes are shattered when we realize that works condemn us. Verse 11. For sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me and by it slew me. So sin is the culprit in all this. Sin would be the, the agent that makes you think you are good enough. So again, verse 11. For sin taking occasion by the commandment, it deceived me and by it, it killed me. Sin uses the good of the commandment and it puts the cart before the horse. It, it deceives in that way. You're okay. You're doing good. You're, you're doing fine. And it uses, that, uh, uses the commandment to deceive. And ultimately, as Paul says here, it, it put me to death. It slew me. Verse, um, before we move on here. So we see that sin is a deceiver. It's constantly blinding the eyes. And do not think that you can... It's kind of... 
it wasn't my intention, but it kind of connected when I was thinking about things here. Do not think you can tame sin, that you have control over it, and you can enjoy it for a little while, and it really won't have any bad effect upon you. Remember when we talked about Samuel this morning, and uh, Saul was basically doing that with Agag. He was he was keeping this representation of his rebellion against God and using it, probably having the hope to use it as a bragging right, but ultimately it was just rebellion against God. We can't get a harness around, a leash around sin and expect to, to use it for our enjoyment. And finally here we see the, the utter or ex exceeding sinfulness of sin in verses 12 through 13. So Paul closes the section by calling out the excessively sinful nature of sin. This is a warning that he gives to us. Verse 12. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy and just and good. And we see in that there's law and the commandment. It's, he's not really making a huge distinction between those things. There's not uh, one aspect that he's necessarily referring to over another. He's just using some different wordings here. <clears throat> so Paul is saying to begin with, is if this is a trial, that the law isn't sin. That was the question to begin with. Is the law sin? No, the law isn't sin. What is the law? The law is holy. And the commandment that is in that is holy and just and good. So after seeing how sin has misrep misrepresented the law, we need to hear that the law is actually not a bad thing. It brings the loss to the point of dependence upon Christ. Now, we don't, in all this, and as Paul is saying this uh, to, the, to the Romans here, he's not saying, okay, now we need to get back to following the Ten Commandments. And now this is the thing that, you know, once you're saved, we see that the law is good. It showed you that you were a sinner, and, and we, need to, we need to get back and live, live according to that. There are some errant views, and um, I would even go as far as saying cultic beliefs, I don't know, there's a technical use of that term, but where they go back to the law. There was a thing out in Utah when we were out there that grabbed a few people, I say that as if they were unaware and they got taken away by it, but uh, where they, what do they call that? Um, Torah. Torah law. And there's probably another name for it, but they, people who got off in their doctrine were convinced by some false teachers that, you know what, we need to live according, we need to go back to the Sabbath, teachings on the Sabbath. We need to go back to following uh, the dietary laws of the Old Testament and those things. But again, the problem with that, and it's what Paul is saying here, and what I'm trying to inform us all here, is the, the works that were expected of the law were ultimately to show that you needed Christ. They never made you righteous. Your works don't make you righteous. It's Christ's blood that makes you righteous. You are supposed to, as a believer, go out and to perform these good works for the Lord and to honor Him. But again, it's not because it makes you righteous. <clears throat> Verse 13, we close with this. Was then that which is good made death unto me? So it's kind of connecting to what he said to begin with. What shall we say then is the law of sin? So was then that which was good uh, made death unto me? And there is that resounding, God forbid, do not think this way. May it never come into your minds that you're living in this manner. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good. That sin, by the commandment, might become exceeding sinful. So, But it was sin that was that has caused death. Law is good, sin is bad. In reality, the law shows how sin was working. It was already working there before you even had, had the, uh, the law to look at. The law shows sin brings death. In the end, sin is condemned, but the only way we can see this is because the law exposed it. The law should be exceeding, uh, shows the exceeding sinfulness of sin. So like, um, as we conclude this evening, like a, a defamation trial, I don't, um, I don't know how many, there was a very famous defamation trial that was on here in the past few, uh, a, a, month, a month or so ago between two famous actors, and there was a trial on 
uh, uh, defamation here. Everybody know what defamation means? Kind of attacking someone's character, saying some things about a person's character uh, would be the case. So saying that, the, uh, here we have what would be like a defamation trial between the law and sin. Sin making, uh, could it make the law sin? No, it cannot. But instead, Paul takes the time to show that the law is good. The commandment is holy, it is righteous, and it is just. And because it brings us to a point of salvation. Um, a point to see our need because of our sins. So we should praise God for giving us this tutor, this schoolmaster, to show humanity its need for Christ and the sinfulness that defines our lives before salvation. Not everything that, I wouldn't agree with everything that uh, Ray Comfort does. Um, Ray, I don't know if you know who Ray Comfort is. He, he and, oh, what's his, oh, what's his name? It doesn't matter. Ray Comfort is the main guy in this, in this uh, evangelistic outreach this, that he does. He's a guy out in California. He's from Australia. And he, has, he, he goes through, one of his tactics is he goes through um, different aspects of the law. For instance, have you lied? Then you're a liar. Have you um, taken a candy bar from a gas station? Then you're a thief. And he's using the law here to show the condemned state that that individual that he's witnessing to is in. You're a liar. You're a thief. Um, he even goes to the New Testament when it talks about have you even had a, a, a lustful thought that makes you an adulterer? Have you even thought and hated a person that makes you a murderer? <clears throat> so as before the Lord. Um, as we go through this and we find out this and we, we understand for a Christian, we're past this. We we understood that the law brought us to our to the to the bottom of, of ourselves, realizing that we need we need Christ because there's nothing we can do to save ourselves. There's no work that we could do. There's no quote unquote law that we could hold to that would make us right enough before God for Him to accept us. Use that as you go to share the gospel with people, um, and kind of we can get creative with it if you would. Uh, when you have that opportunity to go share with someone, um, use your put your biblical thinking cap on and, and ask questions that that are open ended that can't be answered with a yes or no, and that are convicting. Let the Spirit use you in that way. We'll close with that this evening. We're we're done a little early again, but uh, the reason I did that because some of these some of this information.